Hey, I'm Tad Craig, uh, Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church. We know you've been looking forward to joining us uh, for worship in person in our sanctuary. That's why we have added a service to our schedule. You can still join us on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. in our sanctuary. You can also join us at 8 a.m., 9.30, or 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings if you choose to come then. We look forward to seeing you, and I hope that you'll stay safe. Hello, I'm Gary Buffalo, the Minister of Communication here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, reminding you that if you're not quite comfortable returning to gathering in person, or you're traveling or unable to attend for any reason, we'll still have services online on Facebook, YouTube, and Vimeo at 11 a.m. every Sunday. We look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless. Hi, my name is Danielle Hicks. I'm the Minister to Children and Families here at Wilkesboro Baptist. Thank you for tuning in with us today. If you would like to know more about our church, or if you need to talk to someone during this difficult season, please reach out using the information on your screen below.
Hey, I'm Tad Craig, uh, Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church. We know you've been looking forward to joining us uh, for worship in person in our sanctuary. That's why we have added a service to our schedule. You can still join us on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. in our sanctuary. You can also join us at 8 a.m., 9.30, or 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings if you choose to come then. We look forward to seeing you, and I hope that you'll stay safe. Hello, I'm Gary Buffalo, the Minister of Communication here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church, reminding you that if you're not quite comfortable returning to gathering in person, or you're traveling or unable to attend for any reason, we'll still have services online on Facebook, YouTube, and Vimeo at 11 a.m. every Sunday. We look forward to seeing you again soon. God bless.
Hi, my name is Danielle Hicks. I'm the Minister to Children and Families here at Wilkesboro Baptist. Thank you for tuning in with us today. If you would like to know more about our church, or if you need to talk to someone during this difficult season, please reach out using the information on your screen below. Hey, I'm Tad Craig, uh, Associate Pastor here at Wilkesboro Baptist Church. We know you've been looking forward to joining us uh, for worship in person in our sanctuary. That's why we have added a service to our schedule. You can still join us on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. in our sanctuary. You can also join us at 8 a.m., 9.30, or 11 a.m. on Sunday mornings if you choose to come then. We look forward to seeing you, and I hope that you'll stay safe. We're happy to have you to join us for worship here this evening at Wilkesboro Baptist Church. And if you're visiting with us either here tonight or online Sunday morning, we're also pleased that you've chosen to be, to be with us. We hope that you'll feel welcome and we'll come back anytime that you are able. We are going to be fortunate tonight to hear from our associate pastor, Tag Craig, and he's going to be bringing our message. So we're excited about that. And uh, we have a, a nice worship band up here that's going to try to help us to praise God and to sing and bring glory to Him. We're going to begin with looking at God from Psalms 100 as described. His steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 100 verse 1, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness and come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God, and it is He who made us, and we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. Let's stand together as we sing Hallelujah Forever. Hallelujah. 
If you are joining us in the room, we're so glad that you're here worshiping with us on Wednesday evening. And if you're joining with us on television or Facebook or YouTube, thank you for jo- tuning in as well and worshiping with us on this Sunday. If you're on Facebook, you click the share button if you wouldn't mind and uh, share our worship services with those in your Facebook friend groups. Um, I would invite you to turn your attention to the screen for our memory verse for the month of July. It's Proverbs 11.30. Uh, There we go. I I still haven't quite fully memorized it, so thanks for getting that up. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. Proverbs 1130. Wonderful passage of scripture. Uh, Thank you for memorizing that and working on that along with me. A couple of prayer requests for you. The Kazakh people remain our unreached people group to pray for this month. And I'd like you to remember some friends of mine, David and Lindsay Easler. Uh, They're serving the Lord with greater Europe mission in Austria. And uh, pray for them as they continue to share the good news of Jesus. They'll be home on furlough uh, sometime later this year. And so pray for them in their transitions and their travels. They have aging uh, teenage kids. And so just pray for them in their mission work. A couple of announcements uh, that will will be important for all of us to hear. The first one is uh, regard Sunday school. Uh, As I mentioned last week, we're coming back with in-person, on-campus Sunday school for many of our adult classes on Sundays in the month of August. For our kids' ministry, we will have an open house on Sunday, August 1st for you to walk your kids to their classrooms where they might be on Sunday mornings. And then that Sunday school for kids will begin at 9.30, the 9.30 window on Sunday, August the 8th. Pray for us with that. We're still working on uh, identifying every room for those adult classes and, and making that information available. As I mentioned last week, if you're interested in us letting you know what best class we would recommend, Go to our website, go to the Sunday School page on our website, fill out that form, and we'll follow back up with you. Uh, One last announcement before we pray. Our mission at the church is to lead our neighbors and the nations to follow Jesus. We do that by worshiping, serving, learning, and replicating. To replicate means to reproduce a model of or to invite others to participate in ministry. So the next couple of weeks, we're going to be doing that in the life of our church. Uh, Tonight or Sunday morning, you get to hear Tad Craig, our associate pastor, he's going to preach. And if you get our beacon, you'll see the other worship schedule for preachers in the coming weeks. Gary Buffalo will preach as well as some of the other younger ministers uh, that God has kind of sent our way uh, to help along in ministry as they do their education. They're going to preach in in an isolated service over the next couple of weeks. You pray for them as they preach. Uh, you'll hear a fantastic message. I can't tell you how, uh, how thankful I am that God left Tad Craig here for when I came here to be your pastor. He is an incredible associate and youth and education minister. I'm glad to have him. He's got a good word for us tonight. And uh, you listen to him as he preaches to us in just a few moments. Join with me in a time of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do lift up uh, our prayer requests, our burdens, and Lord, there are many. There are folks in our community that are sick. There are folks that are going through surgery and recovering from surgeries. There are folks that need your intervention, and we pray that you would heal and help. We pray, Lord, that you would save those who are lost, neighbors and family members, teenagers, children, friends. Pray that you bring their uh, hearts and lives to you. We pray for our church. Lord, we need a word from you tonight, and I pray, Lord, for Tad as he preaches. I ask, Lord, that you speak through him and you speak to us Uh, Help us to hear what you have to say to us through your word. Lord God, I pray for David and Lindsay. Bless them as they come to the States on furlough. Continue to work through them as they share the good news of Jesus in Austria. And Father, for the Kazakh people, pray that you send missionaries, you would raise up witnesses for the good news of Jesus Christ into that unreached people group. Lord, as we continue to sing songs and praise your name, be exalted and lifted up. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Back last year during the COVID, we sang this uh, with a worship band at least once or twice. This song is called Holy is the Lord, and it deals with the congregation, realizing how holy God is in his sovereignty. It starts with, we stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship him now. How great, how awesome is he. Let's stand together, and as you stand, I'll tell you that this hymn is number 56, I believe, if I remember correctly, in our hymn book. So it is one that uh, maybe you know and maybe you don't, but we hope you worship with us. Here we go. Let's 
sing. We stand and lift up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome is He. And together we see. So what does the cross mean for us when we worship? You know, it's not enough to sing songs about God's love that produce the warm feelings in our hearts. We need to remember the reality of Christ crucified. Ever since Adam and Eve were kicked out of the garden, we haven't been able to reach God directly. Thanks for Jesus. He is our link to our God. In the sacrifice of Christ, the wisdom of God devised a way to preserve the righteousness of God while displaying the love of God to us, us who deserve the wrath of God. Jesus, fully God and fully man, fulfilled the commands of God for us through his righteous life and then endured God's wrath against us at the cross. So what does Calvary mean? Calvary means the forgiveness of sins the upholding of God's righteousness, the satisfying of his wrath, the lavish display of his mercy. It means our adoption into God's family and his victory over sin 
death, and Satan. Many people believe that if we don't get to the, to the gospel in our worship process, that we haven't really completed worship. So the answer to that is, is that every time we worship him, every day, we need to thank him that he gave us Jesus to die on the cross for us. You know this song, and we're not going to ask you to stand. We're going to ask you, if you will, to sing with us and to pay close attention to the words.
So our pastor's been working through the book of Proverbs, um, and last week he told us we needed to be ants, right? Y'all remember that? Sam testing them, Pastor Chris, making sure they're listening. But they told us to be ants. They told us that wisdom can come from an ant because you can take initiative, you can focus on the benefits of the larger community, and you need to work for the future generations. You need to think past the present and look at the future. Well, this week we're going to kind of take a step back from the book of Proverbs, but look at a New Testament example of exactly that. A church that was trying to take initiative, that was trying to find the benefits and focusing on the larger community, and was looking for the future. So turn with me to Philippians. Now, as I was studying, I was getting some background on the city of Philippi. It was in Macedonia, and if you know a little bit of history about Paul and his journeys, Paul went on his first missionary journey after he had the conversion on Damascus. He was a Pharisee, a Jewish Pharisee that knew the law. Jesus rocked his world on the road to Damascus, changed his whole outset. He decided to go and instead of persecuting Christians, become one and start building churches. And so he spent his first, fish, his first missionary journey around the Galatian area, which is just Upper Asia Minor, around Jerusalem, really hitting the cities there, creating churches. Then he was brought back to Jerusalem, where they had the Jerusalem Council, where all the apostles got together, kind of talked through some things, worked on some things, and then had an agreement, disagreement, but then Paul left and went on his second missionary journey. And that's where he got the calling in a vision and a dream. He was told to go to Macedonia. So he takes off to Macedonia, and the first place he stops is Philippi. It's the first city that comes across. It's got a major marketing situation. Market, uh, a lot of trade routes are coming through there. And he meets a lady, Lydia, and she becomes the first convert of that area who is in Philippi. Now, Philippi had this rich history. In fact, it gets its name from Philip II. Now, if you're a history buff, you should have had an eye light. That was a Greek father of Alexander the Great. He's the one that made Greece what Greece was. He founded all these cities and went in, took over, and created the Greek culture as we know it. And then Alexander the Great, his son, took it over. So you have this group of people that had the pride of being part of the first Greek city, first major trade post in the Greek world. Then the Romans came in. They conquered Greece, of course. But the thing about Philippi is they didn't just change Philippi. They kind of left it, and it was the first city to become a providence of Rome. It was one of the first places outside of Rome that they could become a Roman citizen. So imagine walking in, and they coming. the Romans, who were very prideful, who had all this territory, who took over the world, came in and said, you don't have to be under us anymore. You can be like us. That means you get the same privileges we get as Roman citizens by being in Philippi. That's a major achievement. That's a lot of pride. So when Paul comes into this town, he has a group of people that has Greek heritage, that has Roman heritage, and then you have the Jewish people that's come in and have done their customs, and now Paul is coming in and giving them a new way of life. He starts preaching about this guy who went to a cross, died, put himself there for everyone because he loved them and he was the son of God. He was the one that Daniel saw in his dream. He was the one that came and was going to free them. He was the Messiah. He was the Christ. He was the one that we're going to bring them back in a relationship with God. And he starts preaching that in this city. And he starts getting converts. More and more people started coming and they built a church, started in a home, and it grew. And this gospel, this good news, was changing the city changing the community and Paul was excited because even though he started preaching there were people that didn't like Paul and if you read the book of Acts Acts chapter 16 you start seeing they actually put him and Silas in prison 
The Jews got together, put him in prison, and what did Paul and Silas do in prison? They sang hymns. They sang songs. They converted a jailer. I mean, it was just a gospel explosion occurring. So we pick up this letter where Paul is now back in prison. He's been captured by the Romans. He's on his way to Rome, maybe serving in Rome under house guard because he is waiting the final judgment, earthly judgment, but the final judgment. Now he is to go before Caesar and it's either he is released or he is going to die. Those are his options. And so you can imagine he's sitting there in his cell and this church comes to mind. Another interesting thing about the letter of Philippians that's different than the other letters that Paul wrote, it's kind of a joyful letter. It's a letter where he starts off thanking them for their great deeds, their love for him, their compassion for him. And it's amazing to see how he was just overwhelmed with joy. He starts the letter joyfully, unlike the Corinth church. If you start the letter, if you start reading 1 Corinthians, the first letter he wrote, it's not so joyous because the Corinth church had problems. There were a lot of things going on, organization, people were fighting. It was just, it was kind of a bad, bad deal. So Paul writes that letter to the Corinthians, kind of telling them, okay, you need to stop doing this and do this. It was kind of a guidebook for what you need to do to be a better Christian, how to give the gospel, how to be a better community, how to be a better church. That's kind of what 1 Corinthians is. But Philippians is not like that. We see in the book of Philippians, we don't see a lot of, you need to do this, you're doing this wrong, so you need to change and do this. You don't see that in the book of Philippians. You see encouragement, you see words of wisdom in the book of Philippians. But now they're faced, this church is faced with something that they've never encountered before. Their leader, their pastor, their visionary is now probably going to die. And like any situation where there's not a strong leader, where there's not a strong path, and there's a lot of questions, there's a lot of unknowns, they start wondering what to do and they start fighting a little bit. Not bad fighting, just a little quarreling. You know, some people want it this way. Some people want it this way. Remember of all the different customs that were coming about. You remember all the different pride that people had. So you, that's not hard to imagine, right? We've seen that today. In today's society, we see that. We see that in very diverse places where you have a group of people with different backgrounds and different ways that they can be proud of. They start sharing their thoughts with each other, and they don't always get along. And Paul's done a great job of keeping them gospel-centered, keeping them focused on the good news. But now you can imagine he started getting a few letters while he was away. A few things of this person is, is not really being very godly at the moment. He's probably getting another letter that says, Paul, what are we going to do? This group of people is trying to take over. And so we get to Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 12. And he writes these words. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. You see, Paul wanted them to be reminded that they need to continue growing within the gospel. That that, just because he wasn't going to be there, they could continue to be obedient to the Holy Spirit. They could continue being obedient to what Paul had taught them with the good news of Jesus. They could continue bringing salvation and showing salvation to those around them. They could continue that, but it wasn't going to be easy. It wasn't going to be just something that stopped when they made the commitment and became a church. It was going to be difficult. It was going to be really difficult, actually. He says that you've got to work out to continue. I'm using the NIV because in the NIV translation, it uses that word continue to work out your salvation. Now, this is not meaning you can work for your salvation. That's a, that's a key word. 
You're not working for your salvation. You're working out your salvation. You're thinking through it. You're working on it. You're, you're challenging yourself. There's going to be challenges that come. Dallas Willard stated this way. He says that working out in a sense of developing or elaborating something, bringing it to the fullness of what its nature it is meant to be, not as our project, but as God's will. See, Paul was refocusing them not on their own community, not on their own church, but he's giving them back to it's ultimately God's will. And that can be scary because God's much bigger than we are. God's much bigger than this community. God's will is so much greater than what you personally need or want. It's a, the bigger picture. It's about bringing back people to him and seeing his glory and seeing his love. But that means there's going to be changes. There's going to be changes in leadership. There's going to be changes in style. There's going to be changes in how people teach. There's going to have to be changes of how they gather together. I mean, because naturally they're getting bigger. So one house is probably not going to fit them all. So they've got to figure out how do they get all these people? Do they create another group? Do they create this? Do they just keep going here? Do they keep one standard time or do they go to a different time? I mean, they got to work around all these people's schedules. It becomes a great domino effect that can be scary. Because we all have those moments where there's this great balance that we all we have to do in our lives where change is inevitable and we have to embrace it. You can either fight the change, but that's all you're doing is fighting because change is going to come. And that's what Paul is reminding them. And, and if we're honest with ourselves and we start thinking through what that means, the reason we start getting scared of change is because there's unknowns. There's the unknown effect that we can't control. We don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know if we make this move. It could, it's going to change something. So what does that mean? We don't know. So what we want to do is we want to go back to our comfort level. And that's what this church is starting to do. You can start seeing the group of people going, well, it worked like this. Let's just continue working like this. When Paul was here, that's how we did it. And so we should continue doing it like Paul did it. But then there's other people going, well, Paul didn't have this many people. So what are we going to do then? It's scary. It's a fear that comes upon us. And when fear starts getting to us, that's when we start working on our emotions and stop thinking about the future. Our emotions can play tricks on us. And fear is a great emotion that will paralyze you in your tracks. And that's why he says, continue to work out with fear and trembling. So now you're asking yourself, okay, I got it. I got it. It sounds scary. Change is scary. I've been there. I've lived through it. I've had a lot of things. What am I supposed to do about this? Well, how am I supposed to embrace this unknown where I can continue to grow? Well, he gives us that in verses 1 through 11. So flip back to verse, starting in verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1. He says, If you have encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from His love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So the first thing he tells us to do is we need to remember the blessings of the Christian community. That's what brought them together. Remember why they're gathering. Remember what brought them together and made them different than the rest of the communities around there. See, the Jewish community had not really taken hold in Philippi. If you read carefully, it says that Paul and Silas, when they went in there, or their, their ministry strategy, their mission strategy was they would go to the local synagogue. They would, as being a Pharisee, Paul would be given the right to preach and to speak a word. So he would go into the synagogue, he would share a statement, and he would teach them, and he would use that 
to push Jesus and show them how the Old Testament, the Jewish law, was showing people Jesus. That was his strategy. But when he gets to Philippi, there's no synagogue. There's a small gathering of people for him to pray with. So he walks in and see the Jewish community hadn't really taken hold, but now this Christian community had. Why had it taken hold? Is because it showed encouragement of one another. It showed comfort and a peaceful feeling in the middle of it. It showed fellowship among them. They were not fighting. They were not challenging each other. And that showed an affection and compassion. When one was sick, they prayed for each other. When one had a need, they would gather together. Those are the blessings of the Christian community that we have to hold on to. There's the, that's the foundation. That's what Christ did for us. He came in and showed us love and compassion and encouragement. That's what he did with his disciples. He brought them along and said, this is how God's will is. This is what the kingdom of God is. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. It's the blessings, it's the happiness that you get when you're gathered together. See, Paul, he uses that term, if. And it's kind of, it's not like, if I go to the store, I may run into someone. It's an if, it's a rhetorical if. It's like since. Like, it's a reminder of these things. These people, th this church knows these attributes. One scholar wrote, said, if all these things are true, if... In the words of Paul, if all these things are true, if all the words of encouragement are in any way helped you stay true to the faith in the past, then respond accordingly in the present. In other words, if you truly are a Christian, or if you are someone that has said that they have found salvation in Jesus, then you are going to have these attributes. You are going to have these blessings. You are going to show the people around you that you are a Christian by your encouragement, by being a comfort, by being part of a fellowship, and by showing affection and compassion and love to people. That's how you know you have the blessings of the Christian community. And Paul is reminding them, saying, you have these things. I have seen these things. In fact, these things have brought me the deepest joy that I have ever experienced. The deepest joy. In other words, when he is sitting there facing trial for death, what is bringing him out of that despair and depression and just woe is me is the thought that he has a community that supports him, supports one another, and is sharing the gospel to a community that is so ransacked with diversity and cultures and ideas, but they're being focused on the good news of Jesus. You see, it's the harmony that brought him joy. Not somebody coming out and trying to take leadership, not a group of people fighting and bickering because they didn't get their way or things are not going the way they can. But it's getting uncomfortable. All right, I'm going to ask you to do something. All right, so take a moment. You're going to do me a favor. I want you to touch your nose. Good. Now, while you're touching your nose, touch your ear. Some of you are not doing it. You feel, y'all feel uncomfortable? Good. Good, that was a purpose. Y'all can do that now. It was fun to watch up here. But uncomfortable, that uncomfortable feeling is odd, right? Some of you like it better than others. Just like watching across the room, some of you were, y'all were gung-ho about doing it. Y'all didn't think twice. Others of you were reluctant. But you know, when we're uncomfortable, that's where you grow the most. I had a college professor that I'll never forget in sociology, and he was known to rile people up. He was a sociology major, so that's, or a sociology professor. That's what he's supposed to do. He studies people. But he, the first week of class or so, he would say, I know I have a reputation of riling, riling people up, and I do. 
He says, because if I can make you uncomfortable, that means I can know where your passion is and I can know that I can see how you can grow. Because if you look back at your own life, just take a moment, think through those moments that you're uncomfortable. The moments where something hasn't gone according to plan. You got that deep, dark drop in your stomach. That warmth that hits you and starts at your uh, toes and works all the way up to your head. The moment of awkwardness where you don't know if you should say something, you don't say something, do you run, do you fight? Uncomfortable, right? Now, did you grow from that experience? Most of the time, when we're uncomfortable, that's where we grow in wisdom. Most of the time when we're stretched and we're put into that different area, we grow. And the only way we can stay growing is humility. And Paul writes in the next verses, in verse 5, he says, Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus. Or another translation writes, in your relationships with one another, have the same mindset of Christ Jesus. Or another translation says, this way of thinking must be adopted by you, which also is the way of thinking adopted by Christ Jesus. You see, we get uncomfortable because we get too prideful. Uncomfortability, if that's a word, if it's not, I just made it up, we'll put it in the dictionary. But when you become uncomfortable, It's attacking your pride. See, the opposite of pride is humility. And the only way you can continue to grow in your salvation and to work out your salvation is with fear and trembling is because you have to become humble. And he gives us an example through an old hymn. This next verse is verses 6 through 11 is actually an old hymn. It's not Paul's words. At least most scholars don't believe it's Paul's words. They believe it was an early Christian song that was developed very quickly after Jesus ascended to heaven. When they were gathering together, when the apostles would gather together, they had to create these ideas, these thoughts on what it meant to be a follower of this Messiah, of the Christ Jesus, and make him your Lord. And so they created songs. Somebody created this song that spoke of Christ's humility, spoke of his love, of where he had the grasp of being divine, yet he didn't take it. He came down, became a human, lived a human life, served, became a slave or a bond slave to his followers, to his people, died on the cross because of his service, and then he will be exalted high above where every name he is above every name every knee will bow every tongue will confess that he is lord you see we have to have the same mindset or adopt christ's mindset for the future we have to build our foundation on the past not forget about it but look to the future by becoming and staying humble that was christ's mind. Can you imagine being the son of God and having all the power and changing everything that you can? And he didn't. Why? Because he was humble. Because he knew the way to God's will, the way to bring salvation and to bring that relationship back to God was through the cross, which means he was going to have to humble himself. He was going to have to be stripped down. He was going to have to be put on display for everybody to mock him and make fun of him and throw things at him and beat him for us. We're here today because he did that 2,000 years ago. He could have wiped out everybody and started over. He could have come down on the cross, but he didn't because he wanted us here 2,000 years later. He wanted his followers to continue to grow in their relationship with God and to show people what the kingdom of heaven was really like on earth through those blessings of the Christian community. The hymn highlights the humility of Jesus, and it leads us to obedience. So when you're uncomfortable, 
Maybe it's God's way of saying you need to be humbled in that moment. Because maybe you're neglecting the obedience that God's calling you to be. You've let your pride take over. You've let your selfish ambition ruin something. You see, humility is when you cast aside your own rights and liberties to bring peace to someone else. That's what it means to be humble. That's what Christ did for us. He didn't strive to, for a pinnacle of power or human achievement. He came to serve and to expand the gospel for future generations. You know, we've done a wonderful job, our church has, of continually staying the Christian community and, and being a light into the area. We've done a great job of staying firm to our beliefs, sharing the love to those around us. We have people coming. People are seeing the blessings of our community. But I have heard, it's been a great journey, but when can we go back? When can we go back to the way it was, to the normal life? I'm okay. I've, I've suffered this long enough. I've given in long enough. But when, can, can we go back to that? Now, I'm, I'm not too comfortable right now. Well, guess what? Good for you. Because that means God's growing. Your salvation is being worked out. It's going to be with fear and trembling, which is why Paul continues and says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Because God's still working in you. When you stop becoming uncomfortable, then maybe you've not listening to God and you need to reconnect and you need to commit and you need to find out what's keeping you from listening to God. I've probably been the most un uncomfortable that I have been these last 18 months. Right, Pastor Chris? It would be easy to go back the way it was. Trust me, Dr. Mike would probably like it too. The staff would probably like it. It's a lot easier back then because we know what to expect. We have no idea what to expect now. And we're, we've been doing great. And somebody asked me the other day, why are you thinking about bringing Sunday school back? And why are you making it complicated the way it is? Well, guess what? Because God wants us to. Because God has shown us that we need to move forward. And we've got to humble ourselves. And it's going to be hard work. And we have no idea. And I am trembling right now trying to figure out it all. But guess what? God's in control because we don't need to forget about the second half of verse 13. The second half says work because for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. See, God's purpose is still here. God's love is still growing. God's work is not done just like we learned. We got to take initiative. We got to think about our community. We got to look to the future. And we can do that by working out, trying to find the fulfillment of our salvation. Your salvation did not stop when you walked the aisle. It only began. Some of you haven't began the journey of salvation because you're still holding on to your selfish desires. You, haven't, you don't want to admit that Christ can take over your life and forgive you of your sins. You think you've done all the bad things and he'll never forgive you. Christ forgave you on the cross. It's done. He forgot about it. He's asking you to come forward and be a part of this life with him. You don't have to do it alone. You do it with him in community. That's what he's looking for. Jesus went to the cross so that you can live. He defeated death and he came back three days later from the grave to show you you've got hope. You don't have to do this on your own. You do it together. But you've got to make that first step. And that's admitting that you've sinned. Believe that he can take away those sins and then committing to following Christ. That means it's going to be uncomfortable. But he's there to guide you. Some of you have forgotten that your salvation has continued to growing and maybe you need to step out and maybe you need to repent of things. Or maybe you just need to look and say, I've let my selfish desires get in the way and I'm uncomfortable. I don't know what to do, but God, I'm going to embrace it and focus on you and hope and find hope in you. Whatever it is, as we sing this last song, as the band comes forward, Use an opportunity to reflect on your life. 
Pastor Chris will be forward if you need to talk to him. If you feel like this is the community you need to be a part of, he can be here to help you with that. The altar's here if you just need to pray, or you can do it at your home. I can, you can do it at your seat. But remember that just because you're uncomfortable doesn't mean it's a bad thing. It can mean that God is trying to teach you and give you some wisdom. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for all you've done for us. We pray that you will continue working in us and helping us and showing us your love, showing us your grace. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Hicks. I'm the minister to children and families here at Wilkesboro Baptist. Thank you for tuning in with us today. If you would like to know more about our church, or if you need to talk to someone during this difficult season, please reach out using the information on your screen below.